Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Healthy Native Youth Community of Practice call. Um, this is our second session for this year's schedule, and we are going to cover intro to evaluation, gathering info to improve programs. And our guest speakers are Alexis Condrias from NICWA and Nicole Trevenio from Nicole Trevenio Consulting. And we are lucky, I think I saw maybe an OHSU um, background there, but I think Dr. Bill Lambert is on the call, um, as well as Dr. Stephanie Craig Rushing. So amongst these uh, great guest speakers, you also have a couple other gurus on the line. So we hope that this will be um, a great session for everyone. Um, quickly, my name is Amanda Gaston. I'm from the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, and I'm the host for this series. I have been with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board since 2012. And before that, I was an international baccalaureate teacher overseas. Um, I work on Native It's Your Game, We Are Native, and Healthy Native Youth Projects. So I will bounce it over to uh, maybe Alexis first. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexis Contreras. I'm a research assistant at uh, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, or NICWA. I've um, been in this position for about three years now, um, but been at NICWA for about seven, um, where I work, where our research department really um, does a lot of the, um, really supports a lot of the work of the other program work, um, and as well as having other just kind of research projects. And I am excited to be joining uh, the uh, community of practice today. Um, I have worked in a, a variety of programs and services for young people for um, quite a few years and I've been fortunate to have the experience of uh, working on both uh, kind of small program evaluation to bigger uh, randomized control trial uh, kind of studies. And so uh, I'm excited to be joining um, joining this presentation today and excited to talk about um, evaluation and how to incorporate evaluation into program improvement. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, Dr. Lambert, are you on the call as well? Maybe not just yet, or maybe um, he's finding the mute button. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I am Stephanie Craig Rushing. I work at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and we have a team of folks that are working and evaluating adolescent behavioral health programs to support healthy decision making, and happy to be part of the call today. Awesome. And I'll give everyone a chance to, uh, to introduce themselves as well. Um, so again, we want to thank you for being on the call today. Um, we really hope that you continue to join the calls and we really make this a community who practice together. Um, here is our agenda for today. Um, we're going to kick it off um, with our guest speakers spending just a couple minutes on the backdrop of research in Indigenous uh, communities. Alexis will take us through the planning process. And then Nicole will um, walk us through how to interpret data for your community. And we have built in time to kind of pause and reflect and think about um, the content that we're going over throughout the session. But we'll try to save about 10 minutes for the end um, to have some discussion time there too. Um, but without further ado, we would like to give you another warm welcome uh, for being on the call. And now's your chance to um, introduce yourself. Um, and if you could in the chat box, um, so there's a more button on your toolbar. If you can find the chat feed there and type in your name and your role. 
And very importantly, if you could type in your email address, and that way we can get you um, the content from the sessions and give you reminders as well. Um, you can type that in privately if you don't want to uh, type that in the public chat feed. And then we always pose a question to kind of gauge um, where folks are at. But the question for this session is um, if you have any maybe fears, uncertainties, or maybe challenges that keep coming up during your evaluation process, if you feel comfortable sharing that in the chat feed, um, that would be lovely. Thanks for typing in, guys. And while you're doing that, I'll let you know that if you missed a session, um, which we had one last month, and that was a welcome to the Healthy Native Youth 2.0, um, what's available and what's new, you can get on the Healthy Native Youth website, go to the resources and um, support tab, I think it is, and you can click on the Community of Practice tab to get the previously recorded sessions and um, any resources there. And I will note that we are migrating our website currently. Um, so we don't have last month's up yet, but we will hopefully soon. Um, so if you didn't get the email from me a couple days ago, um, just let me know if you want that YouTube link and the slides um, for that session. I'm happy to send that to you. And for the sake of time, um, I'll let you guys continue typing in the chat feed, um, but I will get started. And I will let you know that I will be checking the chat feed throughout. Um, so at any point, please type in any comments or questions you have, um, and we'll be sure to get to them. So without further ado, we will start um, with Alexis, who will give us a little bit of background on research in, in Indigenous uh, communities, um, and Nicole will jump in there as well. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so just to kind of set the, the context for what we're talking about today, and we just wanted to kind of share with you all, um, you know, the, um, some of the historical context around research in Native communities and um, really kind of some of the impacts of the unethical research that happened in tribal communities and kind of explain a little bit why um, they have contributed some, to some of that distrust of research in the communities. And so here's a couple of, of examples. Um, the first example that we wanted to share with you today was the, from the Havasupai tribe. Um, researchers came in and they were taking blood samples from participants and the participants were told that this study was, they were looking at the blood and looking at links between genes and diabetes. And so that was what the study was ar around. But then later without permission, um, those same samples were taken um, and used to study things like schizophrenia, migration, and inbreeding, um, which really, you know, the, this was done without the tribe's permission, and so um, they didn't know that this was taking place, so they really, they felt lied to. Um, some of the, the things that they were studying were um, not things that, the, that those tribal people would have felt um, there were taboo into their culture, and so they didn't feel that their beliefs and their culture was respected, and they really had no choice in the matter as well of how that blood was used, which, um, which is completely unethical. Um, and so the second um, example that we wanted to share with you is from a, the Barrow Alcohol Study. And so this was a study that was done in 1980. Um, there was some, the native leaders and city officials were really working, worried about the local alcohol consumption and some of the um, associated violence with, um, with, with that, that was happening there in their community. And so they invited um, these sociology researchers to come in and kind of um, help them to assess the problem and come up with some solutions on how to address uh, address some of those problems. 
And what ended up happening was this um, this report was released, um, and it was a really um, a really stigmatizing report that was released and without kind of the permission and knowledge of the tribe. The tribe didn't really have any input in the report. And then it was picked up by the New York Times and it said some really, um, some things, um, one of the things that it said in there was that it was a society of um, alcoholics and um, that they were facing extinction. And so that's a really um, just, completely felt stigmatized and um, really created a regional mistrust of research in that area and just doubt that the research that there any research on alcohol would be would re would result in a respectful treatment of their community and so um, we just wanted to give these examples because there has been unethical research in native communities and um, so we want to make sure that, you know, there are reasons, very real reasons, why communities have distrust of, of researchers. And um, Nicole's gonna talk about on the next slide of other ways and how we can kind of really center this in community instead of um, um, being so uh, um, unethical. Yeah, thanks Alexa. Um, those are two, two examples that really highlight um, some of the history of, of unethical research practices, and, and um, those are just two examples. There's many more examples um, throughout uh, the history of, of this country and, um, of, uh, and in others of uh, unethical evaluation or research practices um, related to indigenous communities, and, and also uh, many other communities of color have experienced some of those same uh, some of those same uh, unethical practices. So that gives us a great lens to um, and a foundation to sort of uh, approach the research and evaluation that we do in communities um, with an understanding of encountering uh, mistrust or a lack of interest in partnership uh, that some of those, uh, some of that may be coming from longstanding roots and, and things that may have happened even decades before um, that resulted in, in traumas to communities um, and, and mistrust of uh, research in general. So being uh, focusing on the community and centering the community in the process is a really critical element of making sure that uh, we're, we're not doing something unethical and that we're approaching uh, this work with the level of uh, care that communities need in order to feel confident about uh, participating. So, um, so when trying to be community-centered, I think it's important to focus on the community's needs. Uh, we all have funds and, and organizations that maybe have uh, strategic plans and things that we want to do, but if we're not uh, centering our plans on the needs that the community sees and, and the needs that the community has identified, um, we run the risk of uh, doing some of that work that is unethical or, or stigmatizing um, in some way or just not building good community partners. Um, it's important to think about ways that you can use community-based participatory research or other methods that engage the community in the process um, so that it's not just external folks coming in, but, um, but actually community members that uh, know each other and, and are already maybe connected or at least have some familiarity um, can be helping support and conduct the, uh, the research in a way that, uh, that brings uh, additional trust and, and additional um, sort of focus on the community. Um, it's really important to meet frequently with your evaluators and research staff. And when you do, um, focusing on focusing the conversation on um, how we're going to connect with the community or how we can engage with the community and, and help community members in driving uh, the evaluation or research process. And a big way to do that is to have community members or tribal members in those meetings um, with your evaluators or your research staff um, as a way to help build those partnerships and relationships uh, that trust can be um, sort of built up of, upon. And then finally, um, reminding the community as well as reminding your evaluators or researchers uh, that you may be working with um, of tribal sovereignty rights and the rights of tribes to, uh, to be able to direct this kind of work in their own 
uh, on their own land and in their own communities. Um, so it's really important to recognize that uh, that when we're in um, uh, tribes' land, um, that their sovereignty is is uh, sort of the highest element um, that we need to be um, operating within, um, not just U.S.-based standards or, or university research standards, um, but the tribes' uh, standards and and rules uh, themselves. And so why is research and evaluation important? Well, um, evaluation, it, it really, um, I think of this a lot in um, having that good information that you need in order to improve programs, um, in order to shape content, um, in order to do the decision making that you need. And so um, as evaluators, um, there, it might be used for identifying community needs or important issues in a community. So um, it also might be used as a way to identify different areas of need or shaping content um, and services. Um, we've definitely used this in, um, at NICWA to um, kind of help to shape our content and to help to shape um, the services that we're providing by getting that information um, or data from the evaluation. And um, just with that decision making, um, you can't make good decisions without having that good information to back it up. And so really evaluation is so important um, in just informing that decision making. And I think Nicole had um, some good examples that she wanted to share as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We talked a little bit in the planning for this call about how um, engaging the community in the process can help expand the capacity um, of your staff and, and your team in data collection, um, as well as prioritizing what's most important. What are the questions that are, are critical that we want to answer? Um, and what are the, um, the pathways that we want to go down in identifying needs or, or um, building programs or services from the data we're collecting? Um, so thinking about that in, in the process and as um, just another reason why it's critical to engage uh, the community you're working with in the process. And so this is a resource that came out from UW and it's for researchers and community members who are engaged in research with um, indigenous communities. Um, so there's a link here that um, you'll have access to if you want to check that out. It's a great resource. Covers human, yeah, human subjects research. <laughs> um, and so thank you, Alexis and Nicole, um, for that background. Uh, that's really important to set up the rest of the content here. Um, but Alexis will um, take us away um, with the planning process. Great, thanks. Um, so the first thing that I think about when I'm thinking about evaluation is kind of what are the objectives that we're looking at? Um, you know, we, we talked about why, why it's important a little bit, but you know, so what is it that we're trying to, to figure out with our evaluation? So are we, um, are we looking to improve services or cre create new programs? Um, is there something that we need to measure for a funding requirement? Um, is this, um, a process evaluation, there's um, sometimes that there may be a need to just kind of look at a, pro a certain process and if that is working and um, how well it's working. And then also it could just be for creating marketing materials. Um, these are just some examples of, of, of kind of just to get the thought process going and thinking about what those objectives are. And then just to share some examples. So this, this first example here where I talked about the NICWA training evaluation is um, definitely not an example of a formal evaluation, but I wanted to include this just because I thought that this was something that um, is more familiar to folks who maybe are not researchers or evaluators. I think we've all or many of us have um, gone to conferences or trainings where we're filling out evaluations and um, um, asked to give our, our um, rate, you know, how that trainer was and um, ask for feedback about how 
um, the training went. And um, I just wanted to include this because um, a lot of different people are using some of these components of evaluation in their work and maybe not thinking about it in that way. So at NICWA, we do um, every single uh, training that we have, we have evaluation forms that are, that are passed out, and then um, we read every single one of those. So it really can give you some really helpful information for your, for your training. Um, for example, we've had uh, participants say that, hey, you know, this section of the training, that wasn't really relevant to um, us here in Alaska. Or um, so just knowing that regional advice or um, background, and maybe we don't, there's some things that come up that we weren't aware of. Um, it's also just a tool for those trainers to improve. So um, they might be, um, they might get advice about, I really loved this content. I wish that you spoke more about that. Um, or maybe I, this, this one, I think you spent too much time on that. So it's, it's definitely a useful tool for the trainers to improve their content and delivery as well. And then we do use those for mar to help develop some of our marketing materials by sharing some of those quotes of that feedback that we've gotten on those. So um, it's always great to hear from our peers. And so if our peers say something really great about um, a certain trainer or a certain training, we would just really want to share those things and, and kind of highlight them in marketing materials. And so, you know, our, um, our events manager at NICWA, um, she uses all these different component, components from collecting the data um, to analyzing it and then to use, use that, that information to really um, improve the training or, and also to develop some materials. And then for um, this second example that I wanted to share with you um, about objectives is um, some work that we're doing. It's a three-year initiative in partnership with Generations United and a Second Chance Inc. Um, and it's called Grand Voices Elevating and Strengthening African American and Native American Grand Families. And so this work is really around um, um, giving these grand families um, advocacy training and helping them to share their story um, of raising their relative children and really promote um, culturally appropriate services for grand families. <clears throat> and so in this program work um, uh, or this for this initiative, um, NICWA is also involved with the evaluation of that. And really the purpose of the evaluation here is to be able to show outcomes to our funder. And that's very important because we, we would love to continue work, this type of work, and we'd love to go back to that funder and maybe perhaps get another grant to do more work in the future. And so being able to um, show the outcomes to the funder is really important. As well as along the way, we've gathered a lot of information that we've been able to use um, in kind of tailoring our, our um, trainings and, and understanding what um, participants want. So, you know, we've, you know, we, we do um, surveys with them every six months um, and we've really heard from them that they want more information on policy. Like they want to know what's that policy that's out there that's supporting grand families um, and also um, approaching the media. That was another thing, big thing that came out of there that they were saying, you know, I don't feel that comfortable or I don't have that many skills in this and I, I'd like to know more. And so we were able to take that information and kind of um, be able to have more trainings around specific things that they, but that they were uh, identifying in the search. I'll do a, my webinar. Uh, sorry, just a, a quick interjection. There's, there's one line that's not muted and I think that's a phone call. Um, so if you're on a phone, if you could press star six to mute your line, I don't think I'm able to do that. Sorry, Alexis. Everything else going? Good, good. Yeah, no problem. Good. Good work. It's busy. That's all I can say. <laughs> and so the evaluation steps um, are next. So we kind of have uh, different steps that we need to take. Promotion is what I do, but so they're. 
starting with the first one. So what's the question that you're trying to answer? So really trying to determine what is that question? It, you know, it, it could be, so what are the effects of X, which could be, um, which is the X being the program that's being evaluated on Y, um, Y being the outcomes of interest. So again, for that grand family's um, example that I was talking about, um, really there, our question there that we're asking is what is the effect of an outreach and training program for, for grand families on their sense of self-efficacy in becoming advocates for kinship care? Um, and then what's the information that's going to be collected? So determining how that information is going to be collected. Um, this is here where, you, where you're thinking about your methods, like what are those methods that you're going to be using? And we'll talk a little bit more about methods um, shortly. Um, and then that next step, um, who are you collecting information from? And then how will you invite participants? So um, depending on your project um, and, or the work that you're doing, you might be collecting information from adults, it might be from youth, it might be from a combination of all of those, um, maybe tribal leaders or community, different community members, um, staff. So thinking about who are those people that you need to be in touch with to collect information from. And then also how are you gonna invite those participants or how are you going to recruit them? Um, and so um, it's always great to have incentives as you're doing it, as you're going along for that. So um, even thinking about when you're thinking about um, evaluation, you might also want to be thinking about, um, oh, do we have funds to provide incentives as well? Um, for our grand families work, we do have just, they ha we have a small incentive. It's a, just a $5 um, gift card and um, that they receive each time they, they fill out one of their surveys. Um, so it's great also to have that. And then determining what the type of information that you're trying to collect. So this is kind of um, uh, also looking at that, that first question that you're trying to answer. So um, we talked a little bit more about like um, methods and the, the type of information, but then how are you, how are you gathering this? Is it, is it going to be rating scales? Are you going to ask interview questions? Um, are you going to have a combination of, of, of those? Um, and we can talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, and then what's your evaluation timeline? Um, so, so the initiative that we're working on with grand families, that's a three-year initiative. But we definitely have to have, we wanted, we wanted when we started the work to have a pretest to kind of see where the participants were at, at the start. And then of course we're measuring that over time. So just being very mindful in your planning about your evaluation, you may need to add a few days on the front, um, front end of your, of your um, program or your projects or and then maybe add some days on the back end so that you have time to do those pre-tests, post-tests, um, if it's part of your evaluation. And then just um, creating, lastly, to create a work plan. Um, this is going to help you to um, assign tasks or or manage that, that the workflow um, and also just to track those different components of, of your evaluation. Um, make sure that you're hitting all your deadlines and your deliverables, making sure that everyone knows their role in the process. And, um, and this will help with like, um, I think involving the community and kind of knowing the roles and who's going to be kind of responsible for each of those. And um, that evaluation piece is um, oftentimes one of the things that uh, program folks really have a hard time um, adding enough time in their um, in their overall project work plans uh, to ensure that they have time to build the evaluation process um, in partnership with their evaluators as well as um, making sure that they have time on the back end. So. Even the simple things like pre and post tests, like Alexis mentioned, 
um, really need to happen, right? That pretest really needs to happen before you start implementation. Otherwise, uh, you run the risk of, of kind of contaminating your results. And then on the back end, um, after you've finished a program, you need that extra time uh, to be able to do post tests and focus groups or other pieces that you may want to build into your evaluation. So um, I use this timeline a lot. You can see there at the very top, there's needs assessment. Um, starts as part of that initial early program planning phase um, and then implementation is really like middle to late um, in the process and then throughout you've got opportunities for monitoring which can be a part of your process evaluation um, as well as the evaluation of the program or the service curricula whatever um, whatever it is you might be doing um, you want to be able to do some of that pre evaluation piece and post evaluation piece um, and, and really that, that span of time is a lot longer than just uh, maybe six weeks or ten weeks that you might be doing a program um, with you. It's a great visual. Thank you. <laughs> and then this is uh, the slide. So we talked about methods um, as one of those steps of how will you collect that data. And um, so there's different ways that you can collected data. Um, some of those ways might be quantitative, like surveys, um, or qualitative, like interviews. Um, we have interviews that can be, they can be interviews with a one-on-one, -on -one, um, with groups, so more of a focus group style, um, that are structured or unstructured. Structured, um, structured interviews usually have a set of questions ready to go um, for the, that interview or focus group. Um, also a facilitator of the interviewer focus group, and then a note taker as well. Um, and then unstructured might be someone who, um, you know, you might have a topic that you want to talk about and then um, the group kind of leads the conversation. It's more informal. Um, the, the facilitator will kind of um, introduce the topic and then kind of get get information from people from different people about that. And then observation um, with filling out rating forms on, on what's being observed. So this is another um, tool that we use in evaluate or method that we use in evaluation. Um, we're using this right now with kind of a um, we have what we're calling a fidelity checklist um, where we're um, some work that we're doing around <clears throat> excuse me, it's an evaluation of um, an existing parenting um, training and um, we're hoping that it um, will be classified as an evidence-based practice and so this has, um, it's already a practice-based evidence. Um, we already have practice-based evidence for it but it's a um, positive Indian parenting which has been going on um, for many, many years. And so um, right now we're doing some work around evaluation for that um, to be an evidence-based practice. So we're looking at, um, we're observing, we'll go into the field with the trainer who is going into the home to provide this, um, this training and then making sure that they are getting, they're hitting all the points. So it could be that you as an evaluator are observing something, maybe by video or maybe in person. Um, and then review of records. So this one I put in as an example of it could be that there's existing data um, that you're analyzing and wanting to look at to improve some programs. And then the last method that I put on this slide was the bingo game because this one is a really fun one that we have done at NICWA. Um, and it was created by our founder and senior advisor, uh, Terry Cross. He was doing some work with the Native American Youth and Family um, Center, sorry, NAA. And so um, they were doing some work at NAA around what a successful Native youth looks like and what the culturally, cultural activities that they'd be involved in if they were considered a successful Native youth. And so um, he wanted to go to NEA and take part in a elders dinner that they have there regularly. 
And so he asked if he could come and be a part of this um, this this uh, meal that they all share on every Sunday or whatever day it was and get some information from the elders and talk to the elders about and get some data from them. And so the organizers of Bingo said, that's fine, you can come and come to our meeting, but you need to, you can't interrupt Bingo. You just, you can't interrupt Bingo. It's not gonna work to interrupt Bingo. And so Terry said, okay, I can make that work. Um, and that's how he kind of started this, um, um, or came up with this bingo as a data collection method. And so what he did was he cut out little slips. There's 75 numbers on a bingo board. And so he cut out 75 slips and um, numbered one through 75 and passed them out to all the participants and have them answer the question. So what is it um, that what cultural activities are, are youth involved in if they're seen as a successful native youth. And so um, as they, they collected all of the slips and then those were the numbers that were called, those are the bingo numbers that were called. And so while he's calling, he's reading off the answers that he received. And then someone was also recording the information on um, butcher paper to the rest of the, um, the group so everyone could see all the all the information that was being gathered um, just to let you know some of the examples of things that were listed were learning about family structure and traditions, tanning buckskin, gathering, picking berries, root digging, fishing, drumming and singing, um, and learning about tribal history. And so these were just a few of, uh, of the um, cultural activities that were listed. And as well as after the, um, as well as you always have to have a, a winner in bingo and have some prizes. So he brought prizes, he brought, um, he had a book for a prize, he had um, several t-shirts and mugs as well. Um, and um, after they had gathered their list and the list of information, definitely kind of um, asked the group if they had anything more to add to that and if that looks like a great good list and so um, it's a great way to kind of start off and get people um, get people sharing in a really fun way um, and then people have lots of stories to tell you know about the different items as well so that's great um, and so we we use this and you guys um, can use this too there's um, you can see on this this template that there is a myfreebingocards.com <laughs> so you can kind of go to that website and do this and use this in in your own community to collect um, data and it's a really fun way um, I've done this several times with several different groups and everybody loves it <laughs> it's so much more engaging and fun I think than <laughs> a plain survey right. um, I just want to give a quick time reminder um, I think you've got a couple more slides. Um, so maybe if you could take just a couple more minutes uh, really quickly so we can make sure um, Nicole has time. Great. Um, and so I just, I'll go through these really quickly because I know that um, some of these things we did touch on before with um, um, Nicole when she was talking about centering your evaluation in the community, um, but just building those evaluation partnerships um, approval from tribal leaders is really important. I think you um, you have to, a lot of times they're the ones who are setting policy in the community and so getting them to be on board is really important. And so whether you do that in person or by a letter, um, it's really a good idea to get that approval um, up front. Um, agreements, you might need a data sharing agreement, you might need one or all of these agreements that are listed below. Um, in our data sharing agreements at NICWA, we really um, state that the tribe is the owner of that data. Um, they own the data, they're just sharing with us, um, it's very explicitly laid out what the data is that they're sharing with us and how we're going to be using it and, um, for our purposes. Um, it could be a memorandum of agreement, um, just kind of stating um, what the, the, the work is and how they're going to work to partner together on that. 
um, an agreement or maybe a confidential, it might need to be a confidentiality agreement. Um, you know, especially in that example of the methods of health records, it could be sensitive information um, that you'll need to have some confidentiality agreements around. And so understanding protocols of the community is really important to consider. Um, again, this goes back to relationship building and, um, and building that trust and those partnerships. Um, so maybe you do need to get approval from a tribal leader, maybe it doesn't, or tribal council maybe, but maybe they, um, you know, it might be protocol that you come and you offer a gift or you um, have to come in a good way to do that and how or whatever that means for that community, you should um, just make sure that you understand what those protocols are for that particular community that you're working with. And then um, involving, um, just going back real quick, involving community and youth. Um, this always can be tricky. I, I know um, we've worked really hard at NICWA to involve youth in a lot of our projects. We haven't always been great at it, but we definitely keep trying. Um, but um, one way to do that is to get them involved, um, as like Nicole was saying, with getting the community involved and getting them involved in the process, um, maybe having a youth advisory committee to help you with your evaluation or to help you um, to be able to review um, your questions, review what that you're doing in the community, and it might mean maybe you're doing focus groups with youth. Maybe you think about having a, a youth co-facilitator to help you with those um, um, focus groups. And I'm just going to buzz through um, the next couple of slides, but just for folks reference, um, if, if you're not sure if you need an IRB um, review, an institutional review board review. There's this great graphic here um, that I'll make sure to send um, to folks, and that's from the R Ethics uh, training. Um, Alexis, well done. <laughs> um, yeah, we, ha we post questions throughout, and I think uh, just to make sure that we have enough time for Nicole and then uh, perhaps a little bit of time at the end, if you um, could just use your chat box for this, um, and I'll make sure to check the, the chat um, throughout. But we'd like for you to maybe reflect on how you involve youth in your evaluation process. And folks can start um, chatting and maybe you can offer support for folks who might um, be needing support or comments or um, whatever um, in the chat feed. But we will um, next go to how to use that data um, for your communities, and Nicole will uh, take that off. Um, thank you, Alexis. That was a, a wealth of information that you covered in a very short uh, amount of time. So um, great, uh, great foundational information for all of us to um, reflect on and, and be thinking about as we're uh, going about our work. Um, so one of the things, again, kind of coming back to how we center the community um, in research and evaluation, throughout every stage of the process, there's an opportunity to engage the community or engage youth um, in the process. And sometimes, um, as Alexis kind of touched on, we're all trying to get better at this, so don't, uh, don't disparage yourself if, if you're sort of trying to um, start integrating that into your process. Um, it's, I think what matters is that you're making a, um, incremental steps and having the intention uh, to try to engage your community or your youth throughout the process um, as a way to, to improve your research and evaluation, but also to center the community um, uh, throughout the process. Um, so um, in every stage, as I mentioned, so uh, the community should be helping drive some of the design, even some of the questions that you want to ask. Um, as part of your research or evaluation. Um, they can give feedback on instruments, and this is a pretty common um, aspect that many evaluators and, and researchers already use, um, is to kind of test the instruments. If it's a survey or a, um, something that they're filling out, they're having young people um, go through a few times and um, ask, what do you think this question is, is asking, or um, you know, what, what are we getting at in this question, or do you understand the way that things are worded? 
Um, so it may be a good opportunity to recognize uh, maybe the reading level needs to shift on your um, survey or on an instrument. Uh, maybe you need to ask a question in a different way to get the type of response um, that's really related to what you're asking about as opposed to kind of confusing uh, the audience. You can also engage communities as, as leaders in data collection, as I mentioned before. Um, that's a great way to just um, put a, a community face on, on the process so that people feel comfortable in, in giving data um, and, and um, have the trust that others that um, like them um, are related uh, in, into the process and, and uh, had some kind of leadership um, throughout the process. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the community interpretation of data, so how we can engage folks on um, once we've got our findings or, or got some uh, preliminary results, how can we get the community looking through that um, and telling us uh, what, it, what stands out to you or what, what meaning does this create for you? Um, and then the final piece, um, engaging the community on the dissemination of the findings both in being um, sometimes the person that is disseminating the finding, um, or um, I'm brainstorming with you on where should we put out this information? Should we um, present it at regional or national conferences, or would it be really cool to put out through um, our tribal newspaper or a, a local newsletter um, so that people within the community actually see the results? Um, so then, uh, community engagement and data interpretation. So um, there's a few kind of pieces that you can think about here. Um, presenting the data. So presenting a, a little bit of a preliminary uh, data presentation or an infographic um, and gathering some insights. We did this recently at a, at a meeting with Native Stand facilitators um, from all over the country. Um, our, the evaluators presented some, some information that has been gathered over the course of several years of the project. Um, and it was really interesting what the facilitators thought was important that wasn't in our data, that they had some questions about, well, what, what about this? I know we asked about it. Um, what data came out of that? Um, and so their insights and their, uh, the things that they prioritized gave us some really great feedback to, to think about. Um, in the way that we might present the data. You can do this in a fun way, sort of uh, building on the bingo example. Think about doing kind of a data sharing party or, or an event um, that helps uh, members, maybe the youth that participated in the study or um, the families that maybe were engaged in something. Um, have, a, have a little party, present some of the things, and maybe have table activities or things that uh, you can have them uh, interacting with the data in some way and asking questions or, um, you know, giving insights that maybe hadn't occurred uh, to your team. And then think about you know, the community needs, right? Um, have folks identify the best ways to present the data, the words that they would use or the pictures that they might, might use um, might be really different from uh, the charts and graphs that those of us uh, that are kind of data nerds might want to see um, the community, folks may want to see it in a different way. And so being able to think about those ways that we present the data um, and can, can be a really nice um, addition to the uh, maybe poster presentation style that uh, many researchers or evaluators want to do. And then the distribution piece, as I said, what, what channels should we distribute this information um, through and, and how should we talk about the results that we found? That would really hit on that, um, you know, that community that Alexis mentioned earlier that um, this report came out and they didn't review it um, and it said some really stigmatizing and, and awful things that aren't true about their community and maybe didn't add in uh, the perspective that community members um, would have been able to tell that um, story behind the data is, is how a lot of my colleagues refer to it. Um, how do we tell the story that explains the data? in a way that is respectful to the community that we've been working with. And so remember, throughout the process, we're doing this in partnership with the community, so uh, remember to just continue to involve folks wherever you um, might have an opportunity to do so. So another question for our chat box, um, how has data or evaluation informed your programming? Um, a lot of times we go through the process of doing a, a research or an evaluation component because 
um, our funder requires it, but we don't always take that information and, and funnel it back into program improvements or changes in the way that we're uh, delivering programs and services in, in the communities we work with. Um, so go ahead and use the chat box to answer and I'll keep uh, kind of plugging away to keep us moving forward. Um, so some ways that, uh, that I uh, see data as being important for informing programming is, is to look at all findings as good findings. Um, in a program that I worked on that was really seeking to become an evidence-based intervention and our data didn't get there, um, we didn't meet the, the standards to become an EBI, um, we, we still can use the findings from, uh, from that data to analyze why didn't we need it. We recognize that um, our youth were not sexually active prior to the sexual health education component that we implemented, and they still weren't sexually active at the end of the program or, or six months out. Um, but it may be that they were 12, 13, 14, and in that community, um, many youth maybe just aren't um, sexually active at that stage of, of life. So in the next program, we may want to do um, a program for older youth so that we um, see if it had any change on sexual health behavior or drug and alcohol behavior. Um, using youth focus groups have been one of the most powerful ways to, um, to gather data and, and to think about how we might do a program differently. So um, if young people say, I really didn't like that lesson, or I thought there were too many worksheets, um, how can we change the program to make it more engaging and make it more fun um, while still hitting at the same key messages or learning opportunities um, that we might have gotten in a community feed? Um, sharing findings with people, having the community share their perspective on, on the data what uh, what stands out to young people as, as being important or as being things that um, they might have comments on that, um, that you might not have thought of, but they may help um, kind of sh shift the way that you think about doing programming. And then look beyond the outcome data. I'll talk a little bit in just a sec about um, process evaluation and then the importance of uh, your outcome data tells you one part of the story, but your process evaluation um, can also help you um, tell that story behind the story, um, as, as I mentioned before. We'll go to the next slide. So some things to think about in, in process evaluation, some areas to monitor as, as part of what you might be doing to make some program improvements um, or quality improvements throughout the, throughout the program. Can you all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> can now. Amanda, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Not sure what happened. Oh no. Oh, we can. Yes, we, we, we can, can hear you, Amanda. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so other pieces, implementation, um, and implementation site coordination, um, would be really important. And then uh, partnerships, contracts, those data sharing agreements, um, the evaluation process, um, staff training, development, even staff retention, and then program fidelity, like Alexis mentioned, um, are the facilitators getting through every step of the process um, that we've laid out as, as part of the program. So in, in monitoring, that sound, that's like a laundry list of things that you could monitor. Um, in doing so, don't think that it has to be this really um, intensive process. Um, I have a, a tool that I use with, um, with programs I work with to just track strengths, challenges, ideas for improvement. So every time we hit some uh, roadblock or some, uh, we were like, oh, that was really smart that we did that. Um, let's make a quick note of it and, and think about what made it work or why was it important. And then uh, finally, using the information to make meaning of your outcome evaluation and, and determine future program improvements, um, that's really important. So if we know that, um, like I'm implementing a, a program and we are in, for We Are Native in Michigan, and we've got sites all across the state that are doing, uh, doing the program, but they all do it just a little bit differently. And so if they, in the outcome evaluation, have some different results from site to site, we can look back at fidelity monitoring um, tools and, and the data that they uh, input a, as part of that process to help understand why was this site um, more effective? Did they make adaptations that the others didn't? Or did they stick to the program and, and 
um, that's why they were more effective, whereas others may not have implemented the, the way that the program was written. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So, um, so one final kind of note that I'll leave you with is to make sure that you're maintaining the community's power in the evaluation process. Um, researchers and evaluators have extensive experience and education to get where they are. And uh, our communities have extensive experiences in who they are and um, what their community, how their community operates, um, what things mean. And so, um, so let's not um, put the researchers' experience and expertise um, at, at the highest level. Let's see that as one point of, of perspective and expertise that we need, and that the community brings us other point of, um, of experience and expertise that's really critical to understanding the data that we're gathering and, and the findings that we, um, that we have. So just continuously coming back to the community to help drive that process, making meaning, of the findings, and then helping youth, families, uh, community partners, and leaders inform those key decisions throughout the process, um, like how to use and present their data, what improvements to make in the process, and how to shape future programs and services. And then there's one uh, resource that, uh, that we have that is linked in the presentation as well, um, called Walk Softly and Listen Carefully. So this is all about building research relationships um, within tribal communities. And so it's a great resource that has um, lots of information on, on how to do some of these things that we've talked about today um, that can just be another tool in, in your toolkit um, for approaching the, the research and evaluation that you may do. I have to say a huge whoa, that was a lot of content. <laughs> That's a very big topic to cover in like 55 minutes. So like a huge kudos to Alexis and Nicole. Um, big pat on the back there. <laughs> um, so we have three minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't give us much time um, for discussion. But if you do have a question, please type it in the chat box. Um, we will follow up on email if you left your email address there. Um, so we'll definitely get to it. Um, just one minute on Healthy Native Youth. If you haven't been to the website, check it out. It's new, it's improved. Um, you can get your free interventions and trainings and resources there. The Community of Practice tab is on there. Um, if you haven't yet, like us on Healthy Native Youth, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And we have put out the challenge. If you post, um, you will get a free little uh, packet um, from Michelle Singer, um, who will send that to you. Um, if you're going to any conferences, if you'd like to help spread the word, um, we have promotional activities or promotional uh, materials for you. And thinking ahead for next month, uh, November 13th, we will have Michelle Singer and Tom Tommy Ghost Dog Jr. Um, lead the session on building community support, creating community partnerships. And our schedule um, for the year, as I mentioned, this was our second session. Um, and if you'd like that schedule, it is on the Healthy Native Youth website, but I can also email that out to folks um, if you're interested in sharing. My email address there, um, you can get in touch um, with any questions there. And then of course, a shout out to our funders. Thank you, IHS and Secretary for Minority AIDS Found, uh, Initiative Fund um, for funding this project. So thank you all again. Thank you, Alexis and Nicole, so much um, for all of the hard work that you put in into um, getting this great information out to folks. It was really useful and really well done. So thank you both. All right, and on that note, we finished on time. So I'm gonna stop the recording here. <laughs>